laboratory medicine. It all began a long time ago. Clinical diagnosis was limited to raw observation. We basically used our senses, what we could see, what we could hear, taste, feel, and so forth. If we look back at the history books, then um, in 400 BC approximately, Hi uh, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, we all take the Hippocratic Oath when we graduate medical school, uh, included a number of uh, observations in his aphorisms, his uh, little sayings. And let me read some of them to you. When the urine is thick, grumous and scanty in cases not free from fever, a copious discharge of thinner urine proves beneficial. When in fevers, the urine is turbid, like that of a beast of burden, in such a case there either is or will be headache. <laughs> when the urine is transparent and white, it is bad. It appears principally in cases of phrenitis. Some major advances were made by the time we get to Galen in 131 to 20, he lived uh, 131 to 201 uh, this uh, AD. He was a Greek in the Roman Empire, a physician considered the founder of experimental physiology. Uh, and he did a lot of anatomic examination of animals. He wasn't allowed to examine humans, so he did a lot of dissection. And he observed the normal relationship between fuel, uh, fluid intake and, and urine output. And he described di diabetes as the diarrhea of the urine, I mean, a lot of volume of the urine. His writings on anatomy, physiology, and disease remained authoritative for basically the next 14 centuries. So the, so the things that Galen said, people believed. And if he said that a fever is related to a particular disease, that's what was believed. And that's, or a, a rapid pulse meant a certain diagnosis, that's what, it, that's what people believed. Now we rapidly move up the... Uh, uh, the calendar to around 900, the year 900 or so, um, and, a, and a Jewish physician uh, from Egypt who actually was a physician to the rulers of Tunisia uh, by the name of Isaac Judeus, wrote a book of fevers, and this was widely used as a medical text until the 17th century. And in that book, he described the formation of urine and the value of the visual examination of urine for the diagnosis and prognosis of disease. If you find illustrations of, of this particular doc, he was usually holding a, a flask such as this, running around holding the flask. This became very important. And um, under the uh, Crusades, the, the edict, uh, the Jerusalem Code of uh, 1090, Failure to examine the urine could result in public beatings of the physician. So it was very important. The laboratory was very important. And generally, a physician had to examine the urine. Now, we gradually, you know, we're limited to our senses. And, uh, but over the course of time, there are new inventions, new discoveries that enhance our abilities to observe such things as the microscope and the thermometer these major advances. So in the 17th century, Kircher, a Jesuit priest in Germany, probably was the first to use the microscope to investigate the cause of diseases. And he showed that maggots uh, and other living creatures developed in decaying matter. And so he then, using the microscope, observed these uh, strings of something uh, when he was examining blood of patients that had the plague, and he decided those must be worms also. So he came up with his 35x scope with this conclusion, and so we began to extend our ability to use our observation skills. Um, old ideas on the epidemiology of infection were replaced by bacteriology, and so we have a gradual improvement of uh, human understanding, Seven, uh, 1676, Leeuwenhoek uh, first observes bacteria using a microscope. Uh, by 1862, Pasteur invents the process of killing bacteria by heating. The, and so basically that's how we are able to drink milk today and leave it in a refrigerator for many, many days, if not weeks. By 1867, Lister publishes in The Lancet his discovery that carbolic acid solutions swabbed on wounds markedly reduced the incidence of gangrene. 
Now we're ready for the real dawn of laboratory testing, where we actually start taking these specimens, principally starts with the urine, but we move to other things, and we manipulate them. So we move into the further refinement of urinalysis. Von Helmut introduces gravimetric analysis, but he doesn't really make much use of the fact that we can read densities. Decker uh, observes that urine containing protein would form a precipitate when boiled in acetic acid. That's interesting. And then a, a big breakthrough is uh, from Willis in England. He first noticed that the sweet taste of diabetic urine establishing the differential diagnosis of diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus. So he actually had the gall to take the urine <laughs> and taste it. And lo and behold, it was sweet. And so here we had a major break in terms of our thinking because we <coughs> actually realized different examination, we could actually differentiate between two different disease states. Diabetes insipidus, meaning you just have a lot of urine, there's some other reason, or that you have sweet urine. So we now have a differential diagnosis. Then an English physicist, by, by, physiologist by the name of Hewson, discovers coagulable lymph. Uh, a substance that was precipitated just above 50 degrees that was actually what turns out to be fibrinogen. Dobson in 1776 pr actually proves the sweetness of urine and blood serum in diabetes is caused by sugar. Holm develops yeast tests for sugar in diabetic urine in 1780. And uh, in the meantime, our clinical colleagues are, are starting to realize that measuring heart rate, blood pressure, chest percussion, temperature actually has has clinical value. And so if we think about physicians, the physician practice at about 1800, the majority of their information came from history. And there were increasing amount that was coming now from, from actually physical examination. And a very small little sliver was the laboratory. The 19th century saw medicine was revolutionized by advances in technology, including the laboratory. Stethoscopes were introduced, ophthalmoscopes, laryngoscopes, the mic refinement of the microscope, EKGs, x-rays, all these things added to the clinician's ability to differentiate. This is actually a 1949 picture, I apologize, uh, from the University of Washington. This is, a, this is uh, some docs examining, looking at an x-ray. Again, this is an extension of observation. And I include the radiologists and our friends, the anatomic pathologists, in the category of physical exam. Okay, my little prejudice. <coughs> um, anyway, by 1900, with all the changes that have gone on, we now see a, a, a real change. There is much more emphasis on physical exam, and the lab is starting to grow a little bit in importance. Now, in the early 1920s, um, clinical pathology was really a, an infant specialty generally practiced by internists, uh, but barely recognized by other physicians. So in 1922, a group of these internists, uh, led by Dr. Ward Burdick in, of Denver, gathered his colleagues in a, in a meeting at the AMA and said, we got to sit down and talk about this. And so in, on May 22nd, they gathered together and uh, they came up with a proposal to achieve greater scientific proficiency in clinical pathology and maintain the status of clinical pathologists on an equal plane with other specialists. By the next day, they had 100 people gathered, physicians, mostly internists, and they approved a constitution and bylaws which put in place the American Society for Clinical Pathology. Now, I want to take you through what we're doing, what we've been doing in the lab over the last uh, 100 years or so. And let me give you a, a case example. And we'll look at the uh, diagnosis of acute MI. Early in the 20th century, we really have to look at, I mean, to, to do a, a good analysis, you have to look at what are the physicians doing? Wh what is the practice like? Because the practice of medicine goes hand in hand with what we do in the laboratory. In 1912, um, Herrick writes that in acute MI, if these cases are recognized, the importance of absolute bed rest for, se for several days is clear. 
So if you recognize an acute MI, you put him to bed, bed rest for several days. By the 1920s, they observed that Levine observes that uh, reports that a scar formation may begin as early as four days post MI, but it often took up to three weeks to form. 1939, Mallory, in his autopsy study of 72 patients, found small infarcts healed after one month, larger infarcts at two to three months, because, quote, myocardium must continue to function during the process of repair, end quote, they recommended that the work of the heart be minimized during healing with at least two weeks of absolute bed rest, lying flat in bed with no turning, followed by two to six weeks of less restricted bed rest, meaning they could have the patient gradually sit up and dangle their feet at the bedside. Okay? So, what are we, what are we doing in the lab? How does the lab uh, match the needs of the clinician? We're reporting out white counts. That was the laboratory test used to diagnose and help the physicians follow acute MI. Uh, and this is a quote from one, one study done by Paul Dudley White. Now, Paul Dudley White was the uh, physician to President Eisenhower when, in, back in the 1950s when he had his MI. Uh, but he reports out that uh, it can, leukocytosis can vary from 12,000 to 25,000, but usually the majority of the cells are, are polymorph polymorphonuclear cells, PMNs. Um, and you might even have a smaller inf infarct and see no leukocytosis. So soon on the heels of white count came the red, red cell sedimentation time. Now this is basically our sed rate, but it was done a little differently at first, where they would actually measure the time it took for cells to settle, uh, look to see how far they settled, uh, how fast they settled to 18 millimeters. So You'd have to have a, a person sitting there watching the cells settle, okay? It was a little time consuming. They got a little smart when they turned it around and said, let's just see what it settles in 20, 40, and 60 minutes. <laughs> but anyway, with that said, uh, they found that the sedimentation time was definitely shortened, and in addition, they felt that the tests offered a valuable index to the repair process and that the infarction reaction uh, could not be regarded as having subsided until it returned minimally to above 60 minutes. And so we see studies like this one in JAMA, 1942. And here you see, let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, we've got our sed rate curve. We have a white blood cell curve, pulse, and temperature. So all the things you have to follow when you have an MI. And they follow the patient for a month. Keep in mind, therapy is bed rest. Okay? We got them in bed rest. The first couple weeks, they're just sitting there. We won't even let them roll over. Okay? And so, leukocytosis, white cells, and sed rate are pretty good. Now we get into the 50s. World War II is over, and we have really a birth of, of activity in the clinical labs. All the docs come back from the service, and, and uh, it, our specialty, along with a lot of other, other, other activities in medicine, really takes off. And um, people start realizing, you know, the cells, they're filled with all kinds of stuff. If they break apart, all those things spill out into the serum. And maybe, since they're doing all these metabolic things, and we know about these very different enzymes and stuff, maybe we can measure some of these things. So they discover that, lo and behold, GOT, or what we today call AST, is a great little test to follow MIs. It, it follows a nice little curve, and they... And so here's a study published in Science in 1954 showing um, your SGOT or your AST and SED rate, comparing them in a case, in an MI case. Um, later, they introduced LDH. This is, uh, here we have LDH and AST, again, demonstrating that in acute MI, these enzymes in the course of a few days, go up and down. Very nice test to use in acute MI. We get to 1960. We need more specificity, that these enzymes are present in a lot of tissues, not just in cardiac tissue. And so what's introduced is isoenzymes. The fact that we can take, take these sample, put it in an electrical field, and actually separate out 
uh, various different subtypes. Now they, of course, name LD, the LD isos differently than we do today. So they're actually reversed to what they called LD4 and 5. We today call LD1 and 2. Um, but they describe in this New England Journal of Medicine article how you can use LD4 and 5 in the diagnosis of an acute MI and how LD5 is actually predominant. And here is uh, the early, this is from that same article by Robolewski. You can see the, the tracing for LDs pales in comparison to what we do today, but it was um, very exciting work in the 1960s. By 1965, another test comes along, CK. And this one I think is really sort of fun because CK and CKMB was, was to go on to become the gold standard in the diagnosis of NMI. That's why this is sort of fun to read. The value of C CPK estimations in the confirmation of acute myocardial infarction is not so clear cut. That there is excellent sensitivity and specificity is illustrated by the absence of false negatives and the absence of a rise in a variety of non-muscular disorders tested in this series. The chief weakness in the response of the serum C CPK in association with myocardial infarction is the fact that elevations following infarcts are relatively short-lived. This short duration of activity outweighs the merits of the rapid initial rise, which may be as early as six hours after the clinical onset of the infarct. Because of the disadvantages of the short release span, activity in serum following myocardial infarction and variable range, ranges of normal, Cottonin and Holonin uh, do not recommend the routine clinical use of determination of the enzyme level in the detection of myocardial infarction. The advantages of the sensitivity and specificity of the enzyme are, however, too, too great for it not to be utilized as a differential aid when hepatic disease, conditions associated with hemolysis, or multiple system disorders are present. So basically, what they're telling us in 1965, because of the, how we took care of patients then, we didn't need this test. It went up and down too quick. So it was, no, it was not useful. Okay? Now, medicine did change. Medicine changed radically. And there was advances in cardiac medication, heart catheterization, open heart surgery, th thrombolytics, and angioplasty, and so forth. And the lab responded with a series of, of new, new markers. Uh, just mentioning the most prominent one, CKMB, the CK isoenzyme, myoglobin, troponin I, and troponin T. And there's been a host of other, of other proteins that, that, we've, that we've tried out. And so we come to the year 2000. And um, the Joint European Society of Cardiology and the American College of Cardiology uh, sat down and wrote their uh, recommendations for the use of laboratory tests in the diagnosis. And their recommendation was that the most recently described and preferred biomarker for myocardial damage is cardiac troponin, I or T, which is nearly absolute myocardial, t myocardial tissue specificity as well as high sensitivity, thereby reflecting even microscopic zones of myocardial necrosis. If cardiac troponin assays are not available, the best alternative is CKMB, measured by, by mass. This is less tissue specific than cardiac troponin, but the data documenting its clinical specificity for irreversible injury are more robust. Measurements of total CK is not recommended for the routine diagnosis of acute MI because of the wide tissue distribution of this enzyme. And for patients in need of early diagnosis, rapidly appearing biomarkers such as CKMB or myoglobin, plus a biomarker that rises later, cardiac troponin, is recommended. So there's been a radical change. We've seen over the course of time, we've gone from leukocytosis, very nonspecific, to extremely tissue-specific uh, protein. We've gone hand-in-hand -hand with, with our clinical colleagues, trying to give them tools that they can use to make, make the diagnosis. And what we do dictates what they can diagnose, and what they do dictates where we should explore. Um, this is an experience we've had throughout the department. I mean, throughout the clinical labs, I and mean, you look almost any place. Uh, here's just another quick example, and this is the diagnosis of CML. In 1978, we used morphology and sort of very, what we would consider today crude uh, cytogenetics. 
and the differential included other, other disorders, and there was really no specific therapy. By 2008, the diagnosis is, uh, we use a very specific molecular marker, BRCA-ABLE. Uh, other disorders are excluded by other molecular tests, such as JAK2 mutations, and specific therapy is directed at a molecular lesion by a specific medication. Very expensive, but because the lab really can hone down right to that, that tumor and identify what, the, what tumor that is, we can, we can help our clinicians, our clinical colleagues, with their therapy. They can't work without us, and we can't work without them. So by 2000, if you look at the pie chart now, we have evolved. We've evolved rapidly, and if you really look at a patient's chart, the lab is now equal partners with the history and physical. That's whenever, and I can tell you from an electronic medical record standpoint, the first thing that everyone wants to have on the electronic medical record is the lab. The history and physical can come later. So, let's step back a little, a little bit, and I'm going to present to you a grand proposal. Uh, Gerald T. Evans was a uh, physician at the University of Minnesota. He had been the laboratory director for 20 years. Uh, he was trained as an internist and also did a Ph.D. in physiology. Um, but in 1959, he presented to the University of Minnesota School of Medicine an 80-page proposal to create the first department of laboratory medicine in the United States. And he said, our growth in our own specialty, the techniques of the basic sciences applied to enlightened service and research has lagged compared with the rate of innovation and development in other departments. A laboratory that is standing still is a laboratory that's going backwards. This would apply at any time. This is not any time, but a period of logarithmically increasing volume and importance of technical procedures. We are living in a golden age of medical discovery. Medicine has advanced more in the first 50 years of the 20th century than in all preceding time. The pace is still accelerating. Great discoveries in the fundamental fields have stirred the imagination of clinical investigators and basic scientists. Medicine has been made over. It is from the fundamental fields that new things will come. Progress in clinical medicine will be achieved in large measure through the use of increasing complex laboratory equipment and procedures. Specifically to me, it seems that the hospital laboratories must have the freedom to develop, to keep abreast, to lead and not lag so far behind patient need. In the business of producing young men and women capable of using modern methods and research, the casual or catch-as-catch -catch can approach is outmoded. There needs to be well-supported central area with a major interest in methods and techniques, with a willingness and time to keep in touch with the developments in the basic areas and prepare to offer training and provide trained personnel. How can we support this badly needed enterprise under continuing government of hospital administration, by which, by existing arrangements, must view our field as merely a unit of hospital management? Now, we do make some progress. We, we are starting to, to get some traction with, with our, our clinical colleagues. Uh, Alvin Feinstein, who uh, wrote a very famous book, Clinical Judgment, where he really examined how docs do put together their differential diagnosis, how they do dissect out from all the history, physical, laboratory findings, and other, other measurements, uh, how they come up with their diagnoses. Um, he said in his book, the diseases that have required tax tax and mnemonic attention in modern medicine are entities demonstrated by the new technology. The increasing array of modern laboratory tests has identified physiologic and biochemical disorders, etiologic agents, and many other aspects of disease that cannot be detected from observation of mor morbid anatomy. These new diseases can be discerned from observation of graphic tracings, microbial organisms, chemical measurements, and the results of various other laboratory tests, a new medical specialty called clinical pathology. Now we move 1965. A group of clinical pathologists uh, are meeting at the ASCP, and they, they're, they're feeling, you know, like they don't get any respect, and as we have so often felt. And um, they discuss the problems of teaching laboratory medicine to medical students, residents, and physicians. How do we get people's attention that this is really important? And how do we pursue this and build our field? 
So they continued to meet and discuss the issues, and in early 1966, they founded another organization called ACLIPS, Academy of Clinical Laboratory Physicians and Scientists, uh, with the central idea to promote education and training in laboratory medicine. So in all this, what's going on at the University of Washington? Back in about 1968, the uh, University of Washington clinical laboratories were basically shared by four departments. Um, Dr. Alex Kaplan ran biochemistry in the department of, uh, uh, I mean, ran clinical chemistry in the department of biochemistry. John Sherris was in charge of microbiology in the department of micro. Um, hematology was divided between pathology and internal medicine. King County Hospital did have a clinical lab run by pathology, but hematology was also, again, run by internal medicine. Uh, description. This is, a, this is an interesting description by Paul Strangert of what he encountered when he came out here to look at the, depart at the, at the labs. Uh, he said, the clinical, laboratory, uh, the clinical microbiology laboratory at UH, University Hospital, represented a national standard of excellence. However, the remainder of the laboratory service had major problems. For example, surgery was canceled in July 1969. Um, must be 1968 as equipment failures made it impossible to obtain electrolyte determinations. Many of the instruments provided by the hospital were outmoded and in disrepair. Staffing on the evening and midnight shifts and on weekends was particularly weak. At University Hospital, for example, there was only one technologist available for the evening and midnight shifts for all the laboratories. She routinely worked a double shift. When she was taking a shower in the hospital, no laboratory services were available. <laughs> So Paul, was, Paul Stranded was, was selected as the first chairman of the department. He was brought out here to, to link all these labs together, try to put together a, a service, number one, to build the clinical service, number two, to fix the teaching programs, and number three, to build a research base. And this is, this is Paul at the blackboard with his illustrations of, of some of the things he was planning. And... Uh, so he really wanted to develop an integrated uh, system with the delivery of the clinical labs, uh, realizing he had two hospitals, how best to get the maximum value out of these two hospitals, improve the existing uh, teaching programs, establish new clinical laboratory programs where needed, and development of an environment conducive to the stimulating research by faculty and students at all levels. And so this is his illustration of what he, what he planned to do with the, with the hospital laboratories. And basically, you have Hospital 1, Harborview, Hospital 2, University. We specialize the labs at each side so we don't duplicate where we don't have to. We'll have common labs of both. Link them together with the computers. Now you, that was a very important aspect of it. And also build a central processing area at each hospital to manage the specimens. Now I should say, from a computer standpoint, because that is dear to my heart, um, when I started a, a few years later here, there were two computer systems in, in all of UW Medicine, what is today UW Medicine. There was billing and there was the clinical lab. We were the first, we were the first clinical department to have any sort of computerization. Now Paul also believed in uh, what he referred to as his baseball diamond approach to the design of the labs. And at home base, home base is a processing area the infield is for all the rapid testing and primarily portions of chemistry, hematology, coag, and micro sit right next to the processing area so that at nights and on weekends and those things requiring stat, rapid, rapid testing would be done very close to the processing area. And the other labs could be scattered further apart. Now, the labs were quite meager in terms of what they actually did. This is the uh, charge schedule for virology. Okay, you can only make out there are four, there are basically four assays that are clearly called out. There's uh, Australian antigen. We don't, do we do many of Australian antigens anymore? Uh, herpes, uh, herpes uh, serology, uh, and uh, rubella, and I think Coxsackie. Okay, and there's uh, charges for uh, STAT and uh, so forth. Now, here's a little note from 1971. It's really hard to read. Let me just tell you what it says. This is an apology from the lab. Gee, we're really sorry. Our SMA-12 has been down all day. 
we're doing our best to get the results out, and um, we're, and if we can't get it get it working, we're going to send send the specimens over to Harborview and, and try to get it, and we'll call the results to you at night. I mean, it, it's saying again, we're sorry. Okay, so things weren't all that smooth in the first couple of years. And here's a picture of the SMA-12, one of our two SMA-12s, actually the newer of the two SMA-12s. This is a really, really jazzy looking one. Um, this is our lab requisition from 1972. We could get all of chemistry, uh, hematology, and coag on one sheet of paper with lots of space in between, so it was very clear what you were ordering. Um, the laboratory system, this system uh, that I inherited when I started, um, had been installed in 1971. Um, it did produce really nice cumulative records. Um, it didn't uh, display any normal values or anything. This is a line printer. This is the quality of the print coming off of this. This is what we printed and we, and we charted every day. Um, it did the job. Wasn't that fancy, but um, it was, it was pretty good for its time. Now what's happened? This department that, that originally was set up at two hospitals has grown, and so instead of illustrating it, uh, I, you know, showing you the individual buildings, I have to show you a map of Seattle, because now we are located at Children's Hospital University, on East Lake, at SECA, at, at South Lake Union, and a couple different buildings in Harborview. So, we run a virtual lab. Nobody outside the department, unless they have to come down to the lab, really knows that there's anything special about what we do. They just send, send specimens down to the lab and magically, if the doctor is located, let's say he's over at the university, where's my cursor? If he's over here at the university, he might be getting some uh, viral serologies over here at Children's or he might be getting uh, his flow cytometry done over here at the SECA building or maybe there's some molecular testing that Keith Drum's doing over here at Eastlake. Uh, he may call into the call center, it happens to be. We've got a little administrative office down at, at South Lake Union. Um, it could be TB testing or something else that's being done in Harborview. So these are happening all over the place. We keep this strung together with all of our computer lines and, and uh, it's, it's sort of a magical dance that we do. And everybody thinks it's their lab, and which is what we want them to. Um, in terms of this lab, what is it doing? Mapping out the test volume over the last uh, um, 10 years or so, and, and this, the graphs I'm going to show you are, are the number of tests ordered, and keep in mind that, that there are a lot of tests we do that are grouped. Batteries are one test. Um, so this is not actually the test, the number of results we're putting out, because we're putting out millions of results. But currently, between the two hospitals, and this doesn't include our outreach, um, we're, we're pumping it, we're taking in about, um, uh, oh, I'd say about 300,000 or more orders a month, okay, on average. And, and we've grown quite a bit. We've probably almost doubled in the last 10 years. Um, this is broken down. This is Harborview's orders per month broken down by, by service area and the universities. There is gradual increase. There's been a little drop off at Harborview this last year, which I think now with the adding of all the new ICU beds and so forth will we'll pick up again. And um, I think the future just bodes more work for us. Now if we look at the size of this little department that began with a couple a small little office Paul had with a couple card table chairs. He had one secretary. The office staff was one person. Okay? Um, if you think about that. Uh, he didn't have a desk and uh, they moved from temporary building to temporary building. Today we have 601 classified staff, 50 professional staff, 92 hourlies. That's the, the last number that Elaine gave me this week. I have no idea if it's right or not. I think it's probably close. <laughs> But then you add in all the graduate students, the postdocs, the fellows, and so forth. And we got a fairly large group of people. Now, there are other pressures that, are, that we're, we work under. And uh, if you think about the reimbursement for the laboratory testing, even though we've had this remarkable growth, um, we take something like the BMP, which is uh, 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 BUN glucose and electrolytes. It's a pretty standard group of tests. And um, Medicare, back in 1983, would reimburse that test uh, $12, approximately $12. Now, they have not raised their reimbursement for that test. They've actually found reasons to cut how much they pay us. Now, if we, if we correct that $12 uh, against the consumer price index, 
Um, in effect, $12 today would be getting paid about $5.30. Okay, if we go further, and that's what this graph shows. So there's been a gradual drop off in really what they're paying us to do the test. And then if, if you correct it by the fact that they've actually are paying us less in dollars, so we're probably making about four bucks to do a BMP, which means we're getting paid about a third what we were 25 years ago. Now this happens over and over and over again in the laboratory testing business. So we've had to get very clever to stay up with this kind of reimbursement. And so what you're seeing happening now in the labs is automation. We've got our first automation line in place uh, in our hematology lab at the university. Um, soon, uh, the techs have been, uh, you know, the folks that work in the, in the main lab at the university have done a terrific job cleaning out the space, getting ready to put in our big chemistry line. But these are changes we have to do to keep, keep pace with the changes that are going on in our field. The same kind of changes in the lab will, will happen at Harborview in the next few months also. Now, the department, uh, starting from a handful of faculty that Paul Strandrud inherited, has grown. I've got a couple of charts because we can't get all the faculty onto one chart. And you can't read this. Don't worry about it. Uh, don't look for your name if you're faculty. I've got the faculty listed on, down here on, on the, on the y-axis and programs and um, lab, lab services, research, administrative functions uh, along the... Uh, x-axis. This is the other, the other chart. There's lots of people, lots of things. This is from a small little seed. We've grown into uh, actually a fairly large department. We have 51 faculty now, 18 professors, 14 associate professors, 15 assistant professors, two acting assistant professors, and two lecturers. Of those, and if we look at the, the MDs, there are uh, Six, internal, six in internal medicine, 13 clinical pathologists. <clears throat> I believe there's one more uh, waiting to take his boards. We have eight trained in anatomic and clinical pathology with another waiting board eligible, two anatomic pathologists, and two pediatricians. So it's really interesting when you think of, of clinical pathology, we're always jumbled with pathologists, but in fact, we are making ourselves a distinct, and, and we have been a distinct specialty. We have, uh, in a di our, since we have a large number of MD-PhDs, we have all kinds of expertise, molecular and, and so forth. We, amongst our, our, uh, those, those scientists that are PhD trained and working, uh, probably two-thirds of them are in the research labs, we, they represent micro, immunology, uh, chemistry, and statistics. So we're no slouches today when it comes to research either. When you look at the total amount of grants uh, coming into the various different departments in the medical school, we are certainly not the largest department, but we uh, rank number eight. And we've been there for a, a few years in terms of the total grants that come into the department at the university. This does not include grants that may be obtained by some of our faculty. One in particular, Dr. Larry Corey and his virology group at the Fred Hutch is bringing in, we, the rest of the department pales in comparison to the millions of dollars Larry's bringing. <laughs> <laughs> so we would be ranked easily if we were able to put all that together as the number one department in the country, whether pathology or laboratory medicine, if we could, if we could put it all together. Anyway, all kinds of areas. This is just, these are just a few. The total grants and contracts, as uh, reported by the university, this is in direct, direct dollars uh, per year. Uh, the most recent year over here, the most recent three, last three years, we're in the range of 13 to 14 million dollars. So nothing to sneeze at. Now, we also like to train people. We are trying to do what we were, what Jerry Evans had suggested we do, train the next generation. So if we look back, what was the department like when we started? The clinical pathology residency was struggling, Paul describes. As coordination of the training program using laboratories under the direction of several different departments was difficult, most of the residents in anatomic pathology went elsewhere to obtain training in clinical pathology, and only one resident 
sought training in the new department in 1969. So where are we today? Today we're training usually 10 to 11 residents uh, out of our jointly run program with pathology are, are in a CP year. Uh, we do have, uh, each year we admit one straight CP resident, so amongst that group we have three to four residents that are just training in clinical pathology. Now, every year there is a, there is a test given by the ASCP, and it's, and it's taken, I think, by the vast majority, if not all, residents across the country. And this, is, uh, this tries to test them on the various different skills in clinical pathology and anatomic pathology. I'm only going to show you the, the CP scores of our residents. Um, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to give the residents a, a chance to see how do they rank against their colleagues elsewhere in the country. Um, and it's almost obscene, the results that we have here. Um, if we just look at the column that's the overall program mean, our, our residents were this last time scored 540. The program mean uh, nationally was 487. Um, that puts us four, over four standard deviations above the national mean. And if you look at each one of the categories, we're somewhere much higher than the rest of the country. So I would hope that indicates that Pete and his folks are doing something right, and the rest of the faculty and staff uh, in terms of preparing the next generation. Now, we also inherited the med tech program. Um, it would just come off probation, probationary uh, status. Um, and so the folks that came in, uh, Kathy Clayson and the other, the other folks in our, in our uh, med tech faculty, began a major revision of the, of the training program, introducing new courses in chemistry, COAG, advanced team, and micro. New teaching space was acquired in the T-Wing, and a senior elective was, was uh, developed for the final quarter of the year, uh, where the students were offered the chance to do research. <clears throat> and I don't know if you remember, just a few years ago, the University of Washington was promoting, they said, you know, it's, we're a research university and our undergrad should do research. Well, we were about 30 years ahead of the rest of the university, so this has become an annual uh, very important part of our department. I'm giving the first seminar for the year. The last seminar is given by our med tech students when they present their research. Um, medical technology today is, is in a lot of trouble. Um, we today have a half the number of programs we had uh, 35 years ago. And we're producing nationally about half the number of people. There are many places struggling try to increase, trying to increase their programs now because we're seeing those people trained 30, 35 years ago, retiring, okay, or leaving the profession for other reasons. Um, so we've maintained ourselves. We're, we're enrolling about 25 students a year, um, and we graduate usually between 20 and 23, sometimes more, sometimes less than that. Uh, there are two smaller programs, post-baccalaureate programs, elsewhere in the state, uh, and one in Yakima actually just recently, this last year, doubled their, their number of graduates to six. Um, but our program is doing very well. We uh, in very good standing. We had our program review uh, by our national accrediting agency and, and got through that with flying colors, got another seven years of accreditation. Um, we do other things too. Um, this, I, this is just a little note I received, uh, Mary shared with me. Uh, and this is an email written to Mary, Mary Lampy, the director of our program. And just a short note of thanks and appreciation for the MedTech program's participation with the University of Montana Upward Bound visit. On Wednesday, nearly 50 Native American and or low-income high school students were exposed to numerous healthcare-related career education opportunities at UW. Most of these students would be the first in their families to attend college. The MedTech program was well-received and even mentioned several times by the students during the evaluation session. I'm looking forward to working with Heather and the MedTech program. Thank you, Steve. And here's all those happy high school students from Montana. And, uh, and we're really making a lot of effort to recruit and keep our, our program viable and produce medical technologists that are going to not only serve us here at the University, Harborview, and our other labs, but also go out into the community and into the region. Um, back in 1975, the department decided it was time to build a master's program. So. Uh, 
we had grown and um, Paul felt that a significant need for professional technologists at the master's degree level were needed to provide supervisory and educational services in the laboratories directed by MDs and PhDs. To date, we have had 77 students enter the program. Um, that's including the, the present uh, folks that are in the program. And uh, in 2006, we had a review of this program, and it was actually was sort of a love fest. And at the end, they, the, the major suggestion was that we double the size of our undergraduate program. Of course, the university did not offer us any funding for that. But they thought that the need was so great that we should really work to try to increase uh, the number of students training. Um, we're doing a lot of other things. We're branching out. Um, this is uh, a global health initiative that uh, Karen Stevens is involved in, uh, trying to uh, figure out how to train people in, around the world in underdeveloped countries, how to provide uh, technologists or raise the skills of the people working in, in the makeshift labs that they have, and also trying to work with local companies uh, to develop instruments that actually can work where there is not enough electricity, where the water isn't good, and so forth, where laboratory services can be provided uh, where today there is nothing. It's very difficult to provide modern health care without a clinical lab. That is well recognized. So this program is, is uh, co-sponsored. Uh, Karen Stevens is the uh, principal investigator along with Pat Toten in the, in the Department of Medicine. It's, uh, it's really doing a, a very interesting things. They just had a, a training session um, this, uh, this summer and um, there were 33 participants from uh, 13 countries that came here to Seattle and Karen put on, I don't know how many days, uh, it was actually five, days. five day, five day training and it was really quite impressive. Um, we're continuing to expand into, into education. Uh, there, is, there is no horizon that, that, uh, that's daunting to us. Um, as you know, many of you uh, probably were involved in, in helping and authoring tutorial programs under, under Mike Astin's direction. And eventually the group of programmers, that, that little group, uh, became so successful we spun them off into a little company called MTS. And, um, they have now expanded into proficiency or competency testing, competency assessment, and our faculty continue to work with that company as, as consultants. Uh, today, there are 40,000 laboratory uh, personnel across the country that are taking uh, these competency assessments and approximately 120,000 competency exams a year. Um, so this is quite... Uh, quite uh, an impressive initiative. Um, Mike also began work on um, errors in laboratory medicine. He was very concerned that we should, not only do we try to do a, an excellent job, but can we, can we be even better? And uh, began a little newsletter, which uh, now has been, uh, has been not acquired, but I think we work with it. It's now is published in Clinical Chem News, Clinical Laboratory News and by the uh, American uh, Association for Clinical Chemistry. So this is a major portion of their little newsletter that they send out, and um, this is all being generated here in your humble little Department of Laboratory Medicine. So, quoting Rodney Dangerfield, we don't get no respect. We've been, we've been mucking around for the last so, number of decades, and we still are trying to achieve recognition. Um, oftentimes, even our own faculty, even yesterday, one of my faculty had the audacity to use the word in referring to laboratory medicine as calling us ancillary. Okay, what does ancillary actually mean? <laughs> ancillary comes from the Latin maidservant. Ma okay, and uh, in Webster's Second College Dic Edition Dictionary, which is current for me. Um, ancillary means subordination, subordinate, uh, or that serves as an aid, helping, auxiliary. Now, some of us, I've worked really hard with, uh, with the chairman of radiology, and, and we've gotten the university, UW Medicine, to turn around on this 
and they now refer to us as ex essential services. So pathology came, they were lumped in. So pathology lab and radiology now are referred to as essential services. And I would hope that if nothing else, that when you leave this room, you will never, in referring to the laboratory medicine, use the word ancillary. And if anybody around you does, you will spread the knowledge you've acquired today and let them know that that is not allowed. Because if we turn off the lab, we'll see who's ancillary. <laughs> okay. In conclusion, it's been a very interesting experiment trying to create a Department of Laboratory Medicine. It was a great proposal by, by, Dan, by, by Jerry Evans. So where are we? Uh, did we meet his, his expectations? Well, I think we continue to live in a golden age of medical discovery. I don't think that that's changing one iota. Uh, progress in clinical medicine is achieved in partnership with state-of-the-art clinical laboratories. Our clinical labs have the freedom to develop, to keep abreast, to lead, and not lag behind patient needs. There is well-supported clinical and basic research. We have outstanding training programs preparing the next generation, and we are constantly evolving. So I think we're going, we've gone hand in hand with our clinical colleagues. We are essential. They are essential too. We're just not, we don't get the same kind of press they do. So that when the patient comes in at night, they've had a fever for the last month, and they draw some blood and they send it down to the lab, it's the clinical lab that determines this patient's got leukemia or lymphoma. When there is an anthrax sent in the mail, where, who do you think it is that figures it out? It's the people in the clinical lab. We don't get the accolades. It's always somebody else standing in front of the microphone and the press, but we're there. So I conclude by thanking all of you, because you people are the people in the Department of Laboratory Medicine. You are the people that, that do this, and uh, I think you have a lot to be proud of. And we are not ancillary. <laughs>